basis of our message tonight will be from 1 Kings chapter 19, and that's on page 414 in the old Schofield Reference Bible. Uh, someone asked uh, Dr. Lee Robertson some years ago why he always picked out the invitational hymn uh, at the close of a service and didn't let the song leader do it. He said, for this simple reason, he said, I used to do that until I asked the song leader to lead us in a song at the end of the service, and I gave the invitation, and they got up and sang, I shall not be moved. <laughs> and that's the reason why he said I pick out the invitational hymn. We'll continue our series of messages on of preparing for the battle, and we come down to verse 17 the, of, of Ephesians chapter 6. The first part of it, he says, and take the helmet of salvation. You know, it's interesting that in the, in the, the devil is referred to in the book of Genesis as a serpent. They're in chapter 3, verse 1. And it's interesting that He's referred to as a snake back in 1990, and two doctors at the Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona, began studying the effects of dead snakes after admitting a patient And for almost a year, these doctors focused their research on what they call the dead snake bi uh, uh, Bible phenomena. They discovered that 15% of those people being admitted in the hospital there in Phoenix were uh, bitten by a dead, so-called dead snake. One of the doctors doing the study said this, we were absolutely overwhelmed at the that the percentage was so high. We were also surprised to discover that most people didn't know that dead snakes can still bite. How many of you know, have known that? Would you raise your hand? I've known that. How many of you didn't know that snakes would bite after they're killed? Well, they will, and that's why as a youngster growing up, we killed a lot of water and snakes and rattlesnakes, and we didn't have too many copperheads, but we had a whole lot of moccasins. And thank the Lord for the moccasins and rattlesnakes always give you a warning that they're ready to strike. Now, a rattlesnake rattles, but a water moccasin lets off an odor that uh, my dad taught us to watch for. When we're in swimming, we just hear that odor, Get out, of the, get out of the swimming hole and get, uh, get, a, get to a place where you're safe or look around and see if you can find him and kill him. But then uh, the reason for this is that snakes have a reflex action that continues to work even after being killed. Now, we were taught that if we kill the snake, don't bother the snake before sundown. Right. That sundown, it, it's over. And so anyway... I'm not sure if that's uh, true or not, but that's what we were taught. And for that reason, a decapitated snake can still bite even hours after they're dead. Now, we know that on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ dealt a fatal blow to Satan, but he still is dangerous. And we must ever be on the guard against him. Since Satan is a special enemy, he requires special weapons. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote there in uh, 2 Th uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, where it says, For the weapons are, uh, of our warfare are not carnal. So we can't fight the devil in our flesh. That's what he said. They're, the weapons that we use are not weapons that we would use as a, as a, as 
in our human bodies. He said, but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, Satan does not fear bombs or bullets. He only fears supernatural weapons that are found in the armor of God that the Apostle Paul has been referring to here as we've studied in Ephesians chapter 6. So now we turn our attention to the pieces that make up the whole armor of God that Paul said you put it all, all of it on there in Ephesians chapter 6. And it, it teaches us there in Ephesians chapter 2 that the saints of God are involved in a great spiritual conflict against a powerful, relentless enemy. And our enemy is identified in chapter 2, verse 11, as the devil. And the devil comes against the people of God with various, according to Ephesians chapter 6, wiles. Now, one uh, country preacher called them willies, but it, uh, but it is wiles. Now, if you look up the old English word wile, it means tricks, tricks of the devil. And so he does everything in his power to destroy our faith and draw attention away from his glory. It's, it is God's will that we stand against the attacks of the devil. For in that passage in Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us to stand in verse 11. It tells us to stand in verse 13. It tells us to stand in verse 14. And when we stand, we hold a critical position against the attacks of the enemy. And this speaks of a soldier who refuses to yield even an inch of ground to that attacking foe. It's the image of the defensive, protecting the ground that has already been taken from the enemy. It's what is meant when the Apostle Paul said, neither give place to the devil. In other words, don't give him an inch. Because if you give him an inch, he'll do what? He'll take a mile. And so the piece of armor that has been that has, has our attention in this study is the bonnet of salvation or the helmet of salvation. In a day when men were armed were ba into battle, they referred to this helmet as a bonnet. And the word helmet is taken from the Greek word, uh, well, it's two really two Greek words, which one means uh, around and the other means a head. And when put together, it, uh, it uh, comes up with a definition that it is a piece of armor that fits very tightly around the head. Now, this piece of armor was, the most, uh, was of most importance. And the helmet was made either of thick leather covered by plates of metal, or it was made of solid metal that was beaten into the shape of the, of the human head. And most ancient helmets had metal extensions that covered the cheeks. And these extensions were designed to protect the face. And now it's obvious as the purpose of the helmet, which was to protect the head, the text says that the spiritual helmet is to be worn to, in the battle as the helmet of salvation. Now, we come to the point of salvation it means that you are not ready for battle unless you're absolutely sure you're going to heaven. Salvation is a requirement to get into heaven, and that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this indicates that Satan, uh, Satan starts trying to get us to think differently about salvation. And are there a lot of people that think different about salvation? There are hundreds and hundreds of different ideas about what it means to be saved. And so the devil starts working on the mind in relation to what salvation is all about. Aren't you glad that you settled it one day is that salvation is by grace, through faith, alone, without works? Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you thankful for it and rejoicing in it? And so what the devil will do everything he can to destroy your sense of security and our assurance in Jesus Christ. 
Now, if the devil can strike a blow against us, he'll cause us to become discouraged and have doubts. And so these are two, one of the two areas that we'll be dealing with tonight. We'll deal with the other one like next, uh, maybe next Wednesday night. But the devil will do everything he can to discourage us. And of course, discouragement leads to doubt. And so he will have little trouble sidelining us and taking us out of the battle if we get, uh, get a, become a victim of discouragement and, uh, and doubt. And so look now at the bonnet of salvation and let us learn how this piece of armor can protect us from discouragement and from doubt. So if you're taking notes tonight, first of all, notice the helmet protects against discouragement. Now, if we are properly protected, uh, uh, to, the devil will use the sword of uh, discouragement to feed us in our walk with the Lord. He will cause us to look at our sins. Does he do that? Do you ever do that? Sure he will. He'll cause us to look at our sins and say, look at you. you. You don't even have enough strength to overcome sin in your life. Aren't you grateful that you can come back and say, Yes, I know I don't have that power, but I know someone who does have the power, and if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So he'll do that. He'll, he'll also attack us not only in the area of our sins, but how about our failures? Boy, oh boy. Uh, in my growing up, as a, growing as a Christian, this is the thing that I battle more than anything in my Christian life. Failure. Failure to do, do what I thought I ought to be doing. Sometimes when I don't witness to someone, it, it bothers me to a certain extent, but yet uh, they, the devil will come in and say, see what you're doing? You've glossed out on that one. You've missed that one. And so he continually reminds us of our, our failures. And, and then not only that, when there are problems that come into our life. You ever think about that? I mean, he really will get with us when it comes to problems in our lives. And, and, and how about health issues? Boy, oh boy, does he ever deal with us in the health issue and, and get us to focus on our health problem rather than on our hip problem. <laughs> our health, health answer. And that's the Lord Jesus. And you know what I'm talking about. And he'll get any other negative situation we face in life to do his best to discourage us. And when he gets our attention off the Lord and on the negative issues we face in life, he knows he, we will begin to doubt our Heavenly Father's love and care for us. And this is the effect of causing one to become discouraged. Has anybody in this audience ever been discouraged? Would you raise your hand? The rest of you didn't raise your hand. You're lying. Because sometimes you do get discouraged, and devil will do everything he can to discourage. Even Christians who have been in the battle for many years and have enjoyed much spiritual success can find themselves the victims of discouragement and disillusionment. Now, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19 and see at least one Bible illustration of a person who was discouraged and what the Lord did about it. So if you're taking notes, first of all, there is the illustration of Elijah whose helmet was out of place. And we'll notice that as we go through it. Not many people have ever enjoyed such a string of great spiritual victories like those experienced by uh, the great prophet Elijah. Do you ever know anybody that prayed down fire from heaven? Did you ever know about a prophet that killed 450 false prophets? Uh, you don't know anybody. Boy, you used to think about it. Back in uh, chapter 17 and 18, that's what happened. That's what happened. Then the next day, there came word from Queen Jezebel who was angry, and she said there in verse 2 of chapter 19, she said, 
So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. I got you, give you 24 hours, Elijah, and I'm going to cut your head off. And what does Elijah do? Instead of standing up, he hears about this, and he runs for his life. You know how far he went? He went 100 miles. You go over there and measure it. 100 miles all the way to Beersheba and threw himself down under a, a shrub and, and prays to die. Look at verse 4. He said, just let me die. He was so discouraged that he was ready to quit on God and resign from his office as a prophet and go out into eternity. You ever been there? You ever been so discouraged you want to die? I, I'm sure that Brother Bill Metcalf is watching tonight. Brother Bill and I had a, a visit on the phone today, a prayer together, and, and uh, I love Bill. He's the sweetest Christian. He loves the Lord, and he wants, he wants to be here. He apologized to me. He said, Preacher, I want to be in church. I need to be in church. I have to be in church. I need, I need every bit of the Word of God that I can get. And last night... He lasted all the way through all three sessions of our Bible Institute. Well, Bill told me that his pain was so bad that he was, he was almost screaming in the, even in the night. And he said, I knew, I knew that my wife had to get up the next morning at 4 o'clock and be at work. And he said, I said, Father, either take me home, if you want to take me home right now, you take me, take me to yourself, or would you please give me some relief so that I can get some rest, so that my wife can get rest, so we can go to work. And he said, you can never, you just cannot imagine, Brother Lily, the, the peace that God gave me in my pain as I lay there and I was quiet and was able to, to rest while and let my wife have some rest for the next day. Now, that's enough to discourage somebody, isn't it? I mean, really tell them, hey, why, why quit? Why don't, why don't I just die? I, I've been there. I said, Lord, take me home. I've been there too. You see, God came to him. After, in the midst of all this discouragement, Elijah was given hope and encouragement. But also, God confronted him in verse 9. And the Lord asked Eli Elijah, and I like this, What doest thou here, Elijah? He said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah was in a place that he should not have been. His discouragement had led him out of the will of God, and, 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 but yet the Lord wanted to bring him back. And look now at this passage and see why Elijah wound up where he did and how the Lord brought him back. Now if you're taking notes, first of all, note the circumstances that crippled him. In verses 1 to 4 it tells us, in these verses are three situations that brought him to the point of despondency ready to give up, and ready to give, go in, throw in the towel. And here's what he did. First of all, look, if you will, at verse 3, at the beginning of verse 3. First of all, he saw the wrong things. It says, when he saw that. In the wording here in verse 3, it illustrates the fact that it's always wrong to start looking at things instead of the Lord. Great preaching, but I got three fingers pointing back at myself. Difficult living, but it's right. You hear me tonight? You start looking at things and get your eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll get into serious trouble. And I wrote down three or four uh, illustrations, and if you would like to... Write them down in your Bible. I, we maybe think, maybe take the time to go look at them. 
But over in Exodus chapter 12, verse 10 to 13. The Jewish people saw the facts. And then we read on down in verse 13. And Moses saw the truth. Let's turn there, if you will. Let, let, let's just look over there. Uh, if anybody's got it by chapter 12 of the book of Exodus, if you'll stand up, I'd appreciate it. And you could read it right quick for the sake of time. But maybe we ought to all turn there into Exodus chapter 12 and look at, if you will, at verse 10. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This is what the Jewish people saw. They saw facts. It was a fact that God told them. But then if you go on, you'll see there's going to be a truth take place. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men, man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, and I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token unto the house, houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Now they saw facts up there in verse 10 and 11, and Moses saw truth that back in 13. Now, if you want to see another illustration, just keep moving on over to Numbers chapter 13, if you will. In Numbers chapter 13, you look down at verse 33, and the Bible tells us there, in, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, and I think it talks about, uh, talks about that in that passage. And there they, we saw the giants and the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in, as we were in their sight. That's what they saw. They saw the facts. They saw some giants. They really did see some giants. But if you move on over to verse 5 in chapter 14, you see where the Bible says, and, and, and then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly and the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the, uh, and Caleb, the son of jo uh, Jephunim, uh, which uh, was of them that searches uh, the land, uh, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search, it is exceedingly a good land. If the Lord delight in us, that he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. One saw the facts, the other saw the truth. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. As we go back over to, uh, go forward to 1 Samuel, let's look, if you will, at chapter 17. This is a real blessing as you read it, and it's, it's so, so sweet. In verse 24, in verse 24, and all the men, uh, it's when the confrontation with Goliath, and, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. Now, look what they saw. They saw a truth. They saw somebody that they had never seen before, a giant, a giant. But if you turn the page, and that's the old Schofield reference Bible, you'll, you'll go on down, if you will, uh, to chapter uh, 17, verse 36, and then you'll see David talking. He said, Thy servant slew the, both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. You see what I'm talking about tonight? Some could see the, only the facts in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24 and 25. And David could see the truth in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 36. You see, we need to think about what are we seeing today? 
What are we looking at today? And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. Amen and amen. Now, we not only see that he saw the wrong things, but look, if you will, in the next few verses, in that same context, rather, you'll see that he sought the wrong things. Notice what he did. And he went for his life. Down in verse, uh, verse 4, and he requested himself that he might die. You see, he sought the wrong things. He ran for his life, and then he told God he wanted to die. Two things he shouldn't have thought, sought. What is happening here is Elijah is concerned more about his safety and getting his own way, and his primary concern was his own will and his own way rather than the will of God and the way of God. He was allowing the problems of his life to dominate him by putting self ahead of God. Aren't we all in that shape sometimes? Now, I want you to notice thirdly. He said the wrong things. He saw the wrong things, he sought the wrong things, and he said the wrong things. He said, for I'm not better than my father's. <laughs> well, who told him that anyway? That's just a wrong thinking. It's just wrong thinking. Troubles are going to come. And Elijah should get, wake up to the fact that there are troubles that are going to come into our lives. And if you don't believe it, just hang around a little bit. Yeah, just hang around. You're going to have troubles or troubles are going to come into your life and what you do with them is, is, will determine whether you're going to grow in the Lord or not. Amen? I know many of you know, and I listen to her very, very often, Johnny Erickson, and I'm reading her book on heaven now. And uh, it's, it's so exciting. Uh, she said that Almost 90% of her thinking is on heaven. And she said, it's been that way since I got it settled in the hospital after I found out that I was paralyzed from my neck down. And she said, I wanted to commit suicide, but I couldn't commit suicide. I couldn't even die. So she said there's a young man started coming and reading Revelation chapter 21 and 22 and describing what heaven's going to be like. And she said, when I got my focus off of Johnny and got my focus on heaven, things begin to change in my life. And I got excited about going to heaven and trying to get everybody else I possibly can get me into heaven. Now, let me, let me just share with you, and I, I didn't even put this in my notes, but uh, it came to me, and every one of us ought to uh, think about this in their lives. Colossians, uh, in, in the Bible, in Colossians uh, the chapter 3. I remember so well, um, pastor got in Wyoming. A man in our, uh, got saved in our church, it, whose, wife, whose wife came to our church, but he swore that he had never attend that church. His name was Vern Hardesty. And Vern was, a, was, was an old Western cowboy. And if you know what a Western cowboy is, he always, he may be lost, but he'll tell you the truth. I mean, they're, they're yes and no people out there. They don't uh, dilly-dally around like a bunch of Democrats. They'll tell you what, what's right and what's wrong in a minute. And if you ask them to come to church this Sunday, if they're not going to come, they'll say, I won't be there. I'll guarantee you, I won't be there. And you can bank on it. They're not going to change their mind. If they say, yes, they're going to be there, you can just write it down. You can sit on the front porch of the step, steps of the church, and you'll see them drive up because they say they're going to come. And old Vern was that way. Well, finally, his wife talked him into coming. And old Vern was sitting over on this side in the church. And Vern, uh, 
came forward in the church, and one of our deacons took him and went outside, went, went to the, the rooms to, the, to, the, to my left there, and led old Vern to Christ. Amen. And boy, that old guy, in fact, he could whittle out walking sticks. They gave me a walking stick. I'll let you see it sometime. They're called uh, uh, from Diamond Willows. It's a very beautiful little walking stick that he gave me. And uh, he came in, he, he started, boy, he'd go out visiting with me. He's uh, as, as, just a wonderful old guy. And uh, he loved the Lord. I mean, he got in love with Jesus. Anyway, uh, one day, I, I guess he'd gotten discouraged. And, uh, but he went to where, uh, when you get discouraged, you ought to go to the Word of God. You know that? And you can, you can have folks try to encourage you along the way. But let me tell you something, nothing encourages like the precious word of God. Folks, let me tell you, that it'll, it'll, it'll work every time. And old Vern came bouncing into the church. Now, uh, at, at the, when I passed through that church, my study was on this side of the auditorium, and the secretaries and others' office on this side. And, uh, and I was in my office, and he come bounding in. He said to the secretary, he said, is, is Pastor in? I said, she said, yes, he said, well, you think I could see him? She said, yeah, go over there and knock on the door. He knocked on the door. He stepped in. He said, guess what, Brother Lily? I, I said, what's that, Vern? He said, man, I've been down and out lately. I said, you have? He said, yes. And he said, you know, I was reading in the book of Col uh, Colossians chapter 3. Could I read that to you? And I said, yes, read it, Vern. He said, if then ye be risen in Christ. And he looked up and said, I'm, ri I'm risen in Christ, preacher. I'm saved and born again. Seek those things which are above, what Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He said, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Isn't that a good verse to, to think about when you're discouraged and feel like you're going to quit and give up? And then he went on to say, for ye are dead. I'm dead to that pain. I'm dead to that problem. I'm dead to that discouragement. You're dead. And your life is hid in Christ, uh, with Christ in God. And then he said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall also appear with him in glory. My Christian, you ought to take that and just let it just flood your soul. And let it just take over your life and your thoughts. And boy, you'll be a different person. And you know what? That man taught me something. And you know when I get discouraged, I'll go there too. I'll go there and I'll see exactly what, what Vern saw and what the Holy Spirit said to him. Now, this is just a common, ordinary person who probably hadn't been a Christian more than maybe six months to a year. And yet, he knew exactly what to do when discouragement came. Now, we move on now to verses 5 to 8. I want you to note the compassion that calmed him. It's precious as you look at it, folks. Let's go back over there and I'll, I'll get it. I'm, I don't have it right now, but I'll get 1 Kings chapter 19. Here it is. Look at verse 5. And he said, he slept. He lay and slept under the juniper tree. God said, had already said, now, angel, you go down and take, take something to eat for him. And the angel came and touched him. And he said, arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the, on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drank and laid himself down again. Isn't that just like God? Isn't that just like God? Oh my, when you get to that point, I'm telling you, I've been there. And it seemed like sometimes I've, I've had to get to the point where I just, I rest in you, Lord. I rest in you. And there are problems that come in your life. 
You say, preacher, do you still have family problems? Oh, yeah. My wife and I are burdened over our family. Are you burdened over your family? How many of you have people that you're burdened over and you're praying for and you're asking God to really do something in their lives? Yes. And, and we all are. But let's just take it to Jesus and let him take care of it. And he is. He did. And I want you to notice his gentleness in verse 5. And then the rest of it, you'll notice, there was God's grace. It was seen, first of all, in his presence in verse 5. Some believe that this might have been the angel of the Lord. Now, we know what the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was. That's not other than Lord Jesus himself in his pre-incarnate state. Jesus coming to help him, his presence. And notice, if you will, in verse 6 and 7, his provision. God met his need even when Elijah was going on his own way. You see, God will do that. He'll go ahead and meet your need because he's obligated to do so. Even when you're out of the will of God, he's going to keep on, keep on t- taking care of you. And then, not only that, but it's seen in his patience. You see, God did not write him off because God still had a plan for his life. And that's what I said to Bill today. And we talked today when Brother Bill and I were talking on the phone and praying. I said, Brother Bill, God has something for you. Or he'll take you on to heaven. Right? God has a plan for every one of you here. That's why he hadn't taken you to heaven. When he gets through with his plan, he'll take you to heaven on his time, and you're not going to die before or after. Unless you get, become a fool and commit suicide. And then thirdly, I want you to consider the confrontation that cured him. Over in verses 9 through 18, if you look that, you can break it down and see how God comforted Elijah. First of all, in verse 9, he confronted him about his actions. He confronted him about what he did. You see, God did not call Elijah to live under a juniper tree or live in a cave where he had already moved over. He's moved over now into a cave, and, but he has called him to stand for the Lord. And by the way, God did not save us to be discouraged and be defeated. He saved us to experience his peace and joy and happiness in the midst of all of our circumstances. Amen? Secondly, not only did he confront him about his actions, but he confronted him about his attitude. Elijah wanted to see the spectacular and the majestic. God had to teach him to look at the little things, and too often we do the same thing by getting defeated when God does not do the big things in our lives. If we would just praise the Lord for the little things, we would have plenty to praise the Lord for. As I reviewed this and thought about tonight what I would say, I began to think of all the things that, that the little things that I have. (laughs) Boy, I can go to my closet and my, I I don't ever pick out a suit. Now, don't, don't tell me, don't try, you don't, I don't pick out suits because I would look like Clarabelle the Clown if I came here because I can't put uh, colors together. My wife does all of that. Puts a tie and everything. It's always out there. She always has it ready. And she's been doing that for 160 years. I mean, it's been all of her life she's had to do that. Well, I think she likes to do it because I think she wants me to look pretty good when I stand up here. She can't do anything about the face, but she could at least do something about the suit I wear. And so uh, I begin to think about all the things that I have. You know what? I can turn on electricity in our house. I can sit in a cool, air-conditioned house. I grew up in Louisiana. You put up all the windows you want to out there with no air conditioning. And all the way from July, August, and half of September, my brothers and I would take a quilt and go out and and sleep under the 
pecan tree in front of our house. It'd be so hot we couldn't stay in the house. We just take that for granted, don't we? Yeah. Our old cat has it made. <laughs> so you, you think about, if you start to thinking about the little things that you can be thankful for instead of all the big things that you are lusting after, then maybe we could settle down and just enjoy life. Amen? I believe that with all my heart. Now, thirdly, I want you to notice, not only did he confront him about his actions, not only did he confront him about his attitude, but he also confronted him about his assumptions. You get on down in the latter part of that chapter, you begin to see some things that are absolutely, it's just like, we're living there. We're Elijah. Elijah made two foolish assumptions that were rebutted immediately by the Lord. First of all, Elijah assumed that he had been forsaken. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, even got the hat. I have assumed that everybody in the church was against me at one time. Everybody was against me. And, you know, one time that was that way. And boy, it was, it was daytime. I mean, it wasn't nighttime. It was daytime. And an old boy, a preacher friend, came driving up in front, of my, in front of my church. And he got out and he spoke to the secretary. And he said, uh, Lord led me over here to talk to, to uh, take Brother Lily out to lunch today. She said, I think he's, he's in the office. Just knock on the door. He knocked on the door, and I answered. He stepped in. He said, get up, preacher. He said, the Lord led me to come over here and pick you up and take you out to lunch today. He, picked, he took me out to lunch, and he said, preacher, I just want you to know that I love you and I appreciate you, and I'm one like you. He didn't know I was going to have any problem. He didn't know. He just, he just told me, and man, I want to tell you, when I came out of there, we went back to the office, and I could charge hell with a water pistol. I mean, it, it, it woke me up, and woke me up and realized, hey, wait a minute. It's not over. It's not over. So what's your assumptions? Don't assume that you're the only one. And so God reminded Elijah that there were 7,000 prophets of Baal that remained faithful and they had not bowed to Baal and they're ready to fight with him. So Paul, Paul, put it down, folks. Now here's the second assumption. He assumed that his ministry was over. You can't believe how many times I, I, I've assumed that in my own life of 60 years. You see, Elijah thought his life and ministry was all over and he was ready to die. However, God had big plans for Elijah tomorrow. He said, get down there. I've got a king I want you to, to anoint right now. Get down there, boy. Isn't that wonderful? I like that. That really fires me up. Now, what do we learn from all this? Is there anything we learn from this? He said, well, I filled in all the blanks. I did learn that, Brother Lily. I did a good job filling in. I can raise, stand up right now and tell you I filled in all the blanks. Elijah learned the truth that spiritual victory does not insulate us from discouragement. Someone has said, Satan has many tools but discouragement is the handle that fits every one of them. I think there's a lot of truth in that, don't you? <laughs> we don't think about it, but nevertheless it is true. When we allow problems and pain and people and other circumstances to make us discouraged to the point where we want to quit on God, the devil has won the battle. For, and for a period of time, Satan has caused us to doubt the goodness and grace of our God. And regardless of the reason we, we, we name, when we allow Satan to discourage us to the point where we stop serving the Lord, we are at that moment looking into the face of God and telling him to his face, I don't believe you are bigger than this. 
And that may sound far-fetched, but folks, it's true nevertheless, isn't it? May God help us all to put our trust in him. And as Job said, and we'll be talking about him later, though he slay me, still will I trust him. Boy, oh boy, what a challenge to all of our hearts. And may God help us to be faithful to him. Father, 1 Kings chapter 19 is a tremendous chapter in the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit, through the writer of 1 Kings, wrote it down. That person didn't know that many centuries later, on a Wednesday night, in a church in Trenton, Georgia, that a preacher would be standing up using that as an illustration to help people to look to Jesus rather than become discouraged and want to quit. May we, Father, be strong in the Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And you folks are watching uh, on the, the internet. God bless you, and we want to go to our prayer time now.